This is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Welcome to St. Paul's. Uh, My name is James and it is great to be celebrating Christmas with you today. Uh, In a moment, uh, we will stand as the band leads us singing Christmas carols. And whilst we cannot sing at the moment as a church, let me encourage you to dwell on the words of these songs, to meditate on them and all the goodness that God has done for us in sending Jesus to dwell with us. Uh, And for those uh, online at home, please let me encourage you to sing loudly. But before we stand, let me pray. Loving Father who sent your only Son into the world, that we might have life through faith in him. Grant that we who celebrate his birth on the, at this most holy time come at last to the fullness of life in your heavenly kingdom, where he now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and worship our great God together.
the sovereign of all looked helpless and small as God gave the world his own son. And who would have dreamed or ever perceived that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Certain poor shepherds in the fields as they lay, in the fields where they lay, keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. Is the King of Israel. 
Almighty God, you have given us your only Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin. Grant that we, being born again and made your children by your grace, may daily be renewed by the Holy Spirit through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, welcome to St. Paul's. It is great to be celebrating Christmas with you today. My name is James. We as a church are united by Jesus. We gather because of him who left heaven to be with us, to die and to rise. So as we continue to stand, let's declare what we believe about this God. Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Please grab a seat. Uh, In Isaiah it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied during a time of great trouble, where people were turning away from God, surrounded by their enemies, and they were promised that a son would come a mighty God and wonderful counsellor. For us here in Chatswood celebrating Christmas, it can seem like there is trouble all around us. There is anxiety. There is restrictions. But the same God is in control. He has given us his son, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he has given us his son in times of trouble, and we can remember that today. So let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the excitement and joy that Christmas brings. We thank you for celebrating with family and friends, for giving of gifts to each other as we remember your gift to us. But we ask that you would continue to be with those who are isolated at this time. Comfort them. Fill them with knowledge and peace that comes from relationship with you. Lord, remind them that even though they are isolated and cut off, that because of your Son, we are no longer cut off and isolated from you. Lord, we ask that you would fill our hearts with your love. And as you reveal to us by an angel the coming of your Son as man, so lead us through his suffering and death to the glory of his resurrection. For he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We're going to stand uh, and continue to worship as our band leads us. Please stand.
And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been, has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He will be assigned to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those who, to, on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, 
the shepherds say to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see these things that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurry off and find Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the words concerning what has been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pointed them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, great to be with you again for church. And I frankly can't see anyone out there, really, since the little white mask uh, in the room. So welcome uh, to St. Paul's tonight. My name's Steve Jeffrey. I'm the senior pastor here, uh, if I've never met you before. And uh, if you've got an opportunity to have a Bible open or something in front of you on your device, that'd be fantastic. Go to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to launch into that text which was just read out to us and uh, get really down to the heart of what Christmas is all about. Let me pray. Uh, gracious God, uh, we thank you for this season every year, even though uh, this year is, uh, is a difficult one uh, for us with COVID-19 and restrictions for us, and yet uh, you are still on your throne, as we've been reminded. Uh, and this is a message which is familiar to so many of us. Uh, this is not new information that we're getting tonight. Uh, year in, year out, we hear the news, and I pray that this day, this night, uh, this Christmas season, the reality of Christ on his throne and Lord of all would grip our hearts, and we pray it for the glory of your name and our joy. Amen. So we haven't been able to sing, we've been able to look at words, so let me uh, add some more words to you from a song written in 1984. Soon daylight stole upon us and France was France once more. With sad farewells, we each prepared to settle back to war. But the question haunted every heart that lived that wondrous night, whose family have I fixed within my sight? Uh, they are a part of the words from a song written in 1984 uh, called Christmas in the Trenches. And that song uh, depicts a series of widespread unofficial ceasefires that happened on the Western Front during the First World War in 1914, only months after it began. Uh, collectively, these unofficial ceasefires are known as the Christmas Truce. And so what happened was in the week leading up into Christmas, uh, French, German and British soldiers uh, stopped killing each other at the end of the day and they ventured into the no man's land between the, the two warring trenches and they mingled with one another, they exchanged food, they exchanged souvenirs, they had joint burial ceremonies, uh, they had prisoner swaps, and in fact several of the meetings uh, resulted in uh, the men singing Christmas carols in their own language together. Uh, they even had the odd game of football between one another, uh, creating one of the most memorable images of the truce. And then as daylight came again, they settled back into their trenches and started killing each other until uh, the next day the shooting was over and they got back together again. The nations were at war and yet in that moment there was a sense of peace as the hostilities ceased. And yet what it points to, as much as it's a beautiful moment, what it points to is the reality for us is that something like peace is so, so hard for us to get hold of. It's so elusive. You see, World War I was described as the war to end all wars. They never thought there'd never be another war like it. Of course, peace did come on the 11th hour, 
of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. But it didn't last long. World War II was just around the corner. In fact, since the end of World War II in 1945, there has been a total of 26 days globally. 26 days where there has not been another nation at war with another one. Only 26 days since 1945. And yet what we do is we sing every Christmas about a promise of peace. It's right there. It was just read out to us by John. Luke chapter 2 verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. That song in 1984 was a song longing for peace. As individuals, we desire peace in our relationships. Ironically, one of the most devastating times relationally for people is Christmas time. Did you know that one third of family gatherings at Christmas time end up in blows? Significant family breakdown. I want to praise God for isolation, I think, when we can't get together with family members. As individuals, we long for peace. Our world desperately needs peace. And this bit of the Bible is promising us peace. So what is this peace that the birth of Jesus promises and how do we get it? How, sh- how is it that we should respond to this birth announcement of Jesus Christ? You see, the claim of Christianity is that Christmas is all about the Son of God coming into this world into his creation in order to rescue it, in order to bring it peace. So how is it that we make Christmas meaningful for us? How do we walk away from here and make it something transformational in our lives? Three things from this text. We need to treasure the message. When we treasure the message, we find peace. And when we find peace, we live fearlessly. That's the three things. So firstly, treasure the message. You see, really hearing the Christmas story isn't easy when you've heard it so many times. There's an over-familiarity to the Christmas carols. We, we don't even need to look at the words to know what the next word's going to be as we sing them. You see, hearing well is so essential to this passage here in Luke chapter 2. The the, the shepherds were told something by the angels. And then they went and saw what they were told just as they were told it. Then in verse 17, when they see Jesus, they spread the word about everything that was told them about the child. And then in verse 18, we read, And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And then it goes even deeper in hearing in verse 19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So what we're encountered with here in the first Christmas is something a little bit more than just the nightly news. We all hear news every day, and on the most part, it has no impact on us whatsoever. Those who have got children will know the experience of telling them something and then it not being heard, for them not following through with it. Those with husbands know the same experience as well. Did we hear the information? Yes. Did we give it our attention, think through the implications, really understand what we were being told? Not necessarily. So firstly, we are told here that God speaks to and through the ordinary. As he comes into the world as ordinary, as a humble child, so he speaks through the ordinary. God gives us his word, speaks to us through the ordinary. The shepherds get an angel. You know, they, the, the, the lowly shepherds get angels from God. Everyone else gets a shepherd. Just lowly, low-class shepherds. That's, that's how God communicates. 
The biblical authors get special revelation from God. Moses, Isaiah, John, just to name a few, God turns up, gives them special revelation. The rest of us, we get a book. It's a book that is so easy not to pay attention to. The Bible, God's word to us, the creator of the universe, speaking to us about the way things actually are. His plans, his purposes for all of creation, revealing who he is. It's so easy just to ignore it because it's a book. How many of us have had a New Year resolution where we're going to pick up a gospel and we're going to find out a little bit about Jesus or we're going to read the Bible and we get... We just fall flat somewhere around Leviticus. Just dives off. Secondly, we are told here that Mary is a model for us in listening. She heard the news from the angel and now she hears it from the shepherds and she does not disregard the the message coming from the shepherds. We are told she treasures and ponders it in her heart what she has heard. You see, to ponder here in the original word is to put it into context, to connect what she's heard. That that is, to connect the news of this birth of of Jesus, who he is, with the rest of her life. How does this news explain my life? What does it mean for the way I'm living? It's a focused mental discipline. Discipline. Treasuring is what she also does, and it's a little bit more emotional. It's to keep it alive. It's to, if you like, keep the fire burning of this news in my heart, to relish it, to savor it, to not let it pass by. Mary does not just know the news of the arrival of God intellectually. She fans the flame of this truth in her heart. She keeps pondering it and treasuring it. She takes this news into the center of her being until it means everything to her. Treasuring it means it's an attitude. Her life revolves around this news. Uh, If you're here, I just think it's really important to point out, do not underestimate your ability to hear and yet not to hear the phenomenal good news of Christianity. The gospel. To hear and yet not hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself told a parable about a sower. And this parable has the same sower... And then he has the same seed being cast out. But there are four different responses. People hear, but they don't listen to the word of God. They don't listen to the good news of the Christian message. Some people hear it and don't believe it. Some people hear it and they say, but they believe it, but they don't treasure it. They don't ponder it. They don't let it come into the center of their lives and to change them. We do not want to be like that crowd that just marvels at the news. We don't be like Mary and we want to ponder and treasure and hear well. So let me just say that if you're here tonight and you do not have a Bible, then please take one home. Just If you see one lying around, just steal it. Just take it. It's all good. Do it. If you're online, make connection with us. We will be delighted to send you one and encourage you to read it, to pick up a gospel and discover Jesus Christ yourself. Hear well. Because the, the reason why you would want to do that is that when you hear well, we discover a remarkable promise of peace in this text. If you've got your Bibles there open, have a look at verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom, on whom his favor rests. That is a very specific promise of peace. It's peace for those whom God's grace and favor and mercy rest. Now on the surface, that looks like a promise for just a, a, a very select group. But that, that verse needs to be read in connection with verse 10, which says, The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. 
I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Luke is saying that one of the great benefits of grasping the good news, of hearing well the good news, pondering it in our hearts, treasuring it, is that God's grace means you have peace with God. You see, one of the important themes, this is really, really essential for us to get a hold of here. One of the really crucial, important themes of the New Testament is that before we embrace God's grace and have mercy, have peace with Him through His mercy, we are, in our natural human state, at war with God. Romans chapters 5 and 8 in the New Testament particularly spell this out for us. And most people don't believe that. Most people would say, well, I just don't believe in God. Or I'm just indifferent. You know, like maybe he's there. I don't really care. I don't really know. He just doesn't make any difference to my life day by day. They're indifferent to God. Hardly anyone says I hate God, and, and I would kill him if I got a chance. Romans 8 verse 7 says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. So our relationship with God is not disbelief and indifference, It's actually hostility. We're at war with God. The irreligious person is overtly asserting their independence from God. They openly declare that they're going to live life their way. I'm not going to be submitting to God. He's not going to tell me what to do. I'm my own person. I I rule my world. The religious person covertly asserts their independence from God. The religious person reads the Bible, they pray, they follow the Ten Commandments, they turn up to church at Christmas and Easter, and they they all with the expectation that they will win God's approval. It's an attempt to control God. It's a declaration that I don't, in fact, submit to Him and I don't trust Him. And no matter who we are, in our very nature... We are hostile to God and we cannot stand the idea as human beings that he is in charge. Even as that last carol we sang, that we would bow the knee to him. Can't stand that idea that we would do that. It's a lovely platitude, but we will refuse to do that in our natural human state. Left our own devices, we are all committed to the idea that I will only ever be truly happy if I live life my way. And so one of the key marks of a real Christian is that they come to see that hostility, that they are in fact hostile to God. They have seen not only that they have done wrong things, But even the right things that they have done have been done for wrong reasons, wrong motives. When we turn away from independence from God and accept what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, that's called a peace treaty. The weapons of warfare have been laid down, us to God, God to us. We are now reconciled as we had just sung just even moments ago. The war is over. Grace and peace go together. Those who grasp the grace of God are those who have peace with God. At the very least, it means Christians ought to be peacemakers in the world. It's what Jesus called his disciples to do at the Sermon on the Mount. Peacemakers are people who have admitted their wrongs and their flaws and their sins to God. They have swallowed their pride. They've found peace with God. And when that happens between you and God, it also means that it works its way out into the world and you do it with others. Christians know how to admit that they are wrong 
how to forgive. They know how to reconcile. Peacemakers between races and classes, between family members, between neighbors and colleagues. Peace comes to those who grasp God's grace and to the world through them. How can Christians do that? Because they live fearlessly. That's the consequence of Christmas for Christians. Peace is possible for those who listen well to the word of God, pondered in their heart, treasured in their heart, who grasp the gospel of God's grace. And being at peace with God leads to fearless living. Have a look at verse 8, right at the beginning of the passage that we read out tonight. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. See, the angels, are, the, sorry, the shepherds are terrified. The, the angels even tell them not to be terrified. In fact, they actually say something very significant. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. See the connection? There's a connection between the good news and fearless living. Embrace the good news of Christmas means that we can be at peace with God and live without fear. You see, what, this is crucial because what normally happens in the Bible is that when God shows up to people, they immediately are terrified. Immediately terrified. The first time we see it is in right at the beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they had a great relationship with God. Things were going fantastic. God walked with them in the cool of the evening and they conversed with him and they, they enjoyment, uh, peace and harmony and then they sinned. They decided to have life roll around them. They chose to put themselves at the center of their life. They chose to take the crown off God and put it on their own heads and make everything about them. We all do it. It's the lie that entered into our hearts, everyone's heart, and one of the great sources of all of our behavior as a human race. Adam and Eve did not experience fear until they started to live independently of God. When we have a perfect relationship with God, there is no fear in life. And the reality is, all of us live with fear. The fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of bad things happening, the future, death, fear is connected to not trusting God. Instead, we live each day trying to earn our self-worth. We try to earn people's respect. And if we don't constantly get that affirmation and that love from other people or even from ourselves, we just don't die inside we are slaves to our performance and other people's perceptions it's a life of fear because we know that we cannot control any of those things let alone our future it's hard enough trying to manage other people's perception of us let alone our own future it's why when bad things happen to us, such as COVID-19, we get freaked out because it's just another reminder that we are not in control in our world. We are especially afraid of death. In death, we lose everything. We are filled with fear. But we fill our lives with distractions in order not to think about it. Instead of pondering that, we fed our lives with distractions. Distractions so that we can't listen well to the good news. We are our own masters. We have taken the crown from God and put ourselves at the center of the world. And we are unqualified for the job and we know it. And that's why we live with fear. 
We have taken God's crown, placed in our heads, so to speak, and we are way over our heads. We are way out of our depth. We are usurpers to a throne that we do not deserve nor are qualified for. And on the first Christmas, the real king turned up and we are terrified. The only true response to him is to bow, to lay our crowns at his feet and bow. His beauty shows us our ugliness. His power shows us our impotence. His light shows us our darkness. And when he showed up in the first century, the response of humanity was one of two things. You either worship this guy or you consent to him being nailed to a cross. Christmas is the solution to our deepest problems. Verse 11, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He, Jesus is the saviour. To have peace and to live fearlessly, we need to abandon every form of self-salvation and rest in his salvation alone. The baby born in the manger is the Lord. And this is crucial. The Lord, the word Lord there is translated from the Greek word kurios. It's a very significant word in the New Testament. It's parallel in the Old Testament is Yahweh. The covenant name that God gave to his people, Israel. You see what it's saying here in this verse? That baby born in the manger 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem at the time of Herod the Great. He is not just the saviour. He's not just the sage. He is the creator of the world. If the God who made all things is prepared to humble himself to become one of his creatures and to come into his world, he is trustworthy to lay your crown at his feet. Christmas is God turning up into his world in order to rescue us. Way back in 1961, the Soviet Union put a man in space for the very first time. 27-year-old Yuri Gagarin. He orbited the Earth. It's the first time the Earth was orbited by an astronaut in 89 minutes. He landed safely. And the head of the Soviet Union at the time was a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. And, and Khrushchev said of the event that they, uh, the, the Russians have been into space and God was not there. God doesn't exist. We've been out there. We've looked around and God is not there. The great uh, Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis wrote an article in response to Khrushchev's claims of God not being there, and the article was called The Seeing Eye. He wrote this, The Russians, I am told, report that they have not found God in outer space. Looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading or seeing all of Shakespeare's plays in the hope that you'll find Shakespeare in them. Shakespeare is in one sense presence in every moment in every single one of his plays. But he is never present in the same way that Hamlet, for instance, is in one of his plays. He says, my point is this. If God does exist, you do not find him like the man living on the first floor finds the man living on the second floor by going up the stairs and introducing yourself to him. If God does exist, he relates to the universe more as an author is related to a play than one object in the universe is related to another object in the universe. He went on to ask the question, how then do we find God? 
Or more importantly, how do we avoid God? He says, avoiding God, well, that's easy. Avoid silence. Avoid solitude. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, and all your own grievances. Keep the radio turned on and live in a big crowd. Use plenty of sedation. If you must read books, select them very carefully. But you'd be safer to just stick with the newspapers. To some, God is discoverable everywhere. To others, he's not discoverable anywhere. Lewis went on to write that he has less advice about those who, who, uh, about how to find God. He said, because it is God who has found us. He said, it is God who has come to us. His point in the whole article was the only way to know God, to know our Creator, is as if the God who is the author of life was to write himself into history and to become part of his play. It's the only way. And that is the astounding claim of Christmas. The infinitely wonderful claim of Christmas. Christmas means that God has looked at the world that he has created. He could see the real trouble that we are in, that you are in. And he wrote himself into history. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he did not come just to simply embrace us, but to die for us, to save us. He lost his glory so that the unimportant could have glory forever. He lost his peace so that we could have peace forever. You can trust someone who does that for you. You can trust him with your future. You can trust him with your life. And so do not fear. Look to Christmas. To the degree that we grab hold of the good news and we ponder it and we treasure it in our hearts, to that degree our fears diminish and peace rises. Merry Christmas. God has written himself into human history. Jesus is God with us, God made flesh. And we're going to celebrate the coming of God in flesh with the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you uh, are watching online, you can take a moment to uh, prepare some uh, bread and grape juice or wine. The Apostle Paul indicates the significance of eating and drinking together in remembrance of Jesus in this way. He said, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But these promises are accompanied by a warning. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So uh, let me lead us in a prayer of confession as we confess our sins and our need for forgiveness. That we are people who take the throne of God and, and we push him off it and we sit on it instead. And as we pray, we will be acknowledging that we share together in the benefits of Christ's death. Let me pray. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table. 
but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your son's death for us. Renew us in your service and help us to love one another as members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let me continue to pray. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue our remembrance of his precious death until his return. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, bread and wine, according to our Saviour's command, may be partakers of his body and his blood. Amen. Uh, our helpers are going to come and hand out the, the wafer and the juice. Please hold on to both of those. And our band is going to play and lead a song for us. Take this moment to consider all of God's goodness to us in Jesus.
On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and giving thanks again, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ has died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Amen. God has entered into human history. What a wonderful joy this is. Yes? This is a wonderful joy. It is a wonderful joy that we get to celebrate this at Christmas. That God came and was part of human history so that we could be part of God's story for eternity. What a wonderful joy it is to celebrate that now. Let us stand and let us praise our God with this joy that he has brought to the whole world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every wonderfully. Let's thank our band and our sound team for leading us so well. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Let me pray. Lord God, uh, we, we have come to a point of joy, but Lord, we come to joy from a place of mistrust, a place of lives that are filled with distractions, a place where we miss your good news every year. Lord, this Christmas, help us to live lives of joy based on your goodness to us. Lord, help our lives be fearless. Have, help us to have no fear of death, but trusting in you for eternity, to have no fear of rejection because you have accepted us and to have no fear of losing control because, Lord, you are in control. Help us to trust you. Help us to celebrate your goodness to us this Christmas, but every day. Lord, it not, help it not just be an annual thing, but be a daily thing that we praise you for your goodness to us in Jesus. Amen. Amen. It has been wonderful celebrating Christmas with you, uh, and please go out and continue to celebrate with everyone. Amen.